Good afternoon and welcome to um, in studio today, presented by Cola. Um, at, uh, now we've got Chris Reed from RTI, which is International Trend Institute. And um, today, Chris is going to be talking about a uh, key um, home and lifestyle trends for 2016. So we're really looking forward to what he has to say. Um, and we'd just like to thank Cola for um, sponsoring this and being able to put these talks together. Um, we've had a great, a great turnout today, and we've had some really interesting talks. We will be, we actually are filming all the talks, and we will be putting them on our YouTube channel. So if there's any that you didn't catch or you want to refer back to anything, um, they will be on the DECREX Facebook page and um, links to the videos there. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Chris. Thank you. Hi. So uh, what I'm going to take you through today is ITI's um, Home and Lifestyle Trends for 2016. And as a bit of a background to who we are, um, ITI is an agency based in Durban. It's the International Trend Institute. And we're a branding and communication agency that works with businesses around the country and internationally to help them craft really sort of meaningful communication solutions. But I work within ITI as the lead trend researcher because as part of what we do, we like to make sure that we're understanding what trends are at play in the world, whether it's in the world of interiors or communication or specific products. And then we share it in reports like this and in forums like this all with sort of commissioned clients. So it's really um, quite big picture stuff at heart. And you'll see as I go through, I'm kind of, as, a, as someone who puts together this kind of work, I'm a combination of OCD and ADD. So I like to put stuff into little boxes and then show you lots of pictures. So what I'm going to show you today is not any kind of deep dive into any one of these, but I just wanted to share the top 10 trends that we're seeing in interiors at the moment. And this is kind of globally and very directionally. So I mean, I would hope that after you see what I'm going to show you, you'll be able to walk through the halls downstairs, particularly in 100% design, and see some of this stuff emerging there already. So these are our 10 trends for 2016. Number one is hypertexture. And what we're seeing here is this um, real sort of embracing of texture in interiors again, and not just kind of rustic natural texture, which we've seen for the last couple of years, but this very sort of artificial exaggerated texture across the board. And a lot of this comes out of the, the sort of sportswear trend in fashion. So as what's called athleisure becomes increasingly important in fashion as kind of performance sportswear and streetwear crossover, we're seeing this filter down into homeware as well. So these kind of very artificial and very interesting textures being seen in places like wall treatments, um, rugs particularly, we're seeing a lot of this, the real emphasis of the high-low pile sometimes quite technical and quite artificial, but sometimes mimicking a natural surface. And when I was at Maison et Objet with my uh, colleague um, a while ago, the one uh, sort of editor's hall was all this kind of natural rugs and natural textiles that actually looked like they had things growing on them and coming to life. So while we're seeing this at a very directional level, what we're seeing at a more consumer level is just a massive amplification of texture across the board. So people really embracing texture again. and. From a kind of social and lifestyle perspective, I think what we're seeing is that our world is becoming increasingly smooth and homogenous. So our devices, for example, are all brushed metal and steel and glass, and our homes are quite minimal often. So as Lee Idlecourt, the Dutch trend forecaster, says, our, our fingers are crying out for texture. We're crying out for things to touch and feel again. So we're seeing this represented in homeware through things like this. So these amazing kind of wallpaper panels that would have been quite tacky even sort of five years ago, but now we're embracing this hypertexture, um, even down to a high street level with someone like Urban Outfit is really playing with it at a, at a kind of scatter level. And at a high end as well, and this, what we're seeing here is the, the emergence of quilting again in interiors is quite an interesting direction or quite an important direction. So this, this crossover, not just with athleisure, but with normal tailoring as well, normal clothing tailoring into, into interiors and into objects and in interiors. And what's quite um, gratifying to see is this doesn't just happen at a micro level, it's happening at a macro level as well. So architecturally as well, we're seeing designers really play with these, um, these kind of brie soleil, these kind of window screens, and really amplifying and pulling the texture out of them to sort of take this all the way through a building, not just into the interior, but to the exterior as well. Trend number two is what we've termed grounded. 
And what we see in Grounded is this massive use of sort of mineral textures and mineral colors and mineral inspirations in homeware in all kinds of different places. So Tom Dixon, for example, turning his rugs into the kind of mineral inspiration in the installation, so actually showing how they degrade into the sand and the stone that inspired them. Um, or to these rugs, again, you see this kind of hypertexture high-low, but when you go to the trade shows, a lot of the kind of floor coverings particularly are mimicking pebbles and mimicking the sea floor. And I even saw downstairs one or two of the stands had kind of crushed uh, hazelnuts or something, crushed shells on the floor as well. So we're seeing this desire for texture underfoot as well. And it's being seen a lot in color treatment as well. So I know Plascon's color of the year is a very kind of blush mineral neutral again. So you're seeing these kind of this minerality and color, and especially in your kind of more grounded neutrals. But it's quite interesting when you look at the way that this kind of treatment or this reference to the earth and to mineral is being used in, in marble and in marble finishes. So marble textiles, for example, are being seen. So if you go downstairs, one of the, um, one of the sofas is made with a, a texture that's made to look like marble. And I know Dr. and Mrs. did a similar thing with a collaboration earlier sort of a while ago. Um, but this French designer, Mathieu Leneur, actually sculpted a massive sheet of marble to look like a swimming pool. So to kind of play with this, this sort of tension between fluidity that you get through something like marble, but then also the staticness and the kind of minerality of the thing as a whole. And at the same time, we're seeing this kind of terrazzo inspiration being seen in, in, in flooring, as, but in textiles as well. So this kind of almost aggregate look in different um, places. And here's the Doctor and Mrs. reference I was talking about. So textiles that actually look like marble, they're not just kind of, it's not just marble, but it's things that are trying to mimic marble as well and things that are trying to mimic the mineral. And what gets quite interesting here is this mixture between the kind of very mineral and the very artificial. So this, these are vases by Moreno uh, Ratti, which are um, marble encased in perspex as well. So it's this tension or this kind of contrast between the man-made and the natural. And I think this is the, an interesting commentary on where we're at at the moment as a society. And former Fantasma, the uh, Italian design studio, did something very interesting with this with this clock made out of two counter-rotating sheets of marble. So it actually then speaks to this idea of what's called geological time. So the fact that we're trying to ground ourselves in a much longer time frame as well, because the world feels like it's moving increasingly quickly. Um, we kind of are constantly updated with what's happening around the globe through social media and through news updates. So what they were trying to do is slow it down and sort of reference back to this idea of mineral time as well as human time. Trend number three is what we've called slick. And what we see with this is this use of iridescent and um, sort of almost petrol-like finishes in all kinds of places. So it's inspired from two different aspects. The first, of the first of these is this kind of rainforest textures and rainforest colors. So the Rio Olympics, obviously very present in our minds, kicking off this year. But what we saw as part of that was this focus on the colors and textures of the rainforest in design around the world. And one of these things is this kind of very iridescent texture. But interestingly, while this is quite natural, because it's, it speaks to this idea of mother of pearl, of insect wings, of even birds' plumage, it also speaks to the incredibly man-made as well. It looks like petrol, it looks like holograms, it looks like all kinds of very artificial things. So again, you see this tension in design happening. So it's the mineral and the man-made, the man-made and the artificial. Um, and it's, it's coming up in all kinds of interesting places. So starting in fashion, as these things often do, but filtering down through things like oxidized metal to really bring this iridescence and this, this mother of pearl finish to interiors as well. Uh, Tom Dixon was doing really interesting things with this, with his, um, I think the collection's called Oil. So playing with fragrances that, that speak to this, but then also finishes uh, in his products that have the same kind of slickness and the same oil look to them. And this was a really sort of quite directional uh, sort of light that came out of Berlin from uh, Neocraft. And what they wanted to do was make lighting features that look like soap bubbles. So this speaks to kind of ephemerality as well. It speaks to this idea of here today, gone tomorrow, because it's, it looks like kind of bubbles of soap. It looks like a, a petrol slick. It looks like a rainbow. It could just disappear at any moment. So I think we quite like this as a metaphor for where we're at in design at the moment. Trend number four is the brutal truth. This is a personal favorite of mine, but one that a lot of people might not like. But because what we're seeing is this influence of uh, brutalism again in design. So brutalism being an architectural movement that emerged in the 60s and 70s, if I'm not mistaken, um, which was really characterized by 
harsh materials and very kind of raw materials, so raw concrete, raw stone, raw wood even, and glass, um, to make very functional utilitarian spaces. So Ponty Tower, for example, in Joburg is a really good example of a brutalist building. They're kind of very much just about function, and the form follows suit. And this is kind of architecture for architects. It's not something that consumers generally liked. It's not something that, that the public generally liked. But what we're seeing is designers now, possibly who didn't have to grow up with, surrounded by these things, um, are now starting to turn back to them for the honesty that brutalism has. So we're seeing it influence new builds. We're seeing it influence product design. Um, we're seeing it even influence things like playgrounds, which is quite interesting. So I'll show you a video next from um, Assemble Studio in London. And what they wanted to do was reclaim this sort of brutalist look in a soft play area, so sort of playing against the soft and the hard and showing that brutalism isn't necessarily all about um, sort of hardness and, and hurt. Um, and we're just seeing more and more concrete being used almost um, naturally by people now. It's no longer new to use concrete in your interiors. It's kind of accepted, um, which is why I, I found the PPC Imaginarium um, entries downstairs particularly interesting if you look at the way that those young designers are using concrete as well. Um, so the video I'm going to show you now is from Assemble Studio and just shows how they were reclaiming this brutalist um, look in their, in their project for this playground. The Brutus Playground is an interactive and conceptual installation. It explores the abstract play spaces that were devised as part of possible housing estates by recreating these visual elements within the gallery space. We're working with Assemble and artist Simon Terrell. They are using the archive as a creative tool to reconstruct and reimagine these play structures. What really drew our attention to these play spaces was a completely different criteria of public space that they show before the time of liability and risk and the ways that we understand that now. It's the psychology of space that I find really interesting. The architecture of different spaces induce a different inhabitation. Privatised, very highly controlled, semi-public space, very different thing to an uncontrolled open access area. These playgrounds, they are such a wild, strange gesture that these architects made. And I think that speaks to something about that optimism, that time of the welfare state. There were big ideas then about remaking the world anew. A lot of the things that we're recreating aren't obvious. They're these very unusual forms, almost like a condensed brutalism. And I think that's what's really cool, that it's free architecture without constraints. So I think you see the fun that the architect's having making these amazing structures. It's very, very hard to design for play because play is actually an incredibly complex set of behaviours that is determined by the child. When you look back to some of those brutalist playgrounds, what you see is a sign that you're allowed to interact with this environment a bit differently, that the normal rules are suspended, that you don't have to rush through it, that it's a place that you can maybe co-opt to your own ends. The power and its ambiguity is it takes itself out of the logic that maybe dominates most of the other built spaces in the city. Brutalism is associated with a bush-hammered concrete, which is very hard and sharp. And playground, I think, in today's eyes, is something that's very soft and safe. These concrete playscapes that we're looking at in this exhibition pose massive risks. Risk is something that should be thought about rather than something that should be avoided entirely. There was something quite perverse about recreating these concrete structures in something that was the complete antithesis and was the ultimate in soft play. The structures themselves have posed a challenge. How do we take these objects and be faithful to their scale and make them at one-to-one -one in the gallery space constraints? What's exciting is that not only is it going to be about how do you play on these structures and how it, should they be used, but the moments where they intersect with the gallery It opens itself up, something between an architectural object, a sculpture, and um, a theatre set. Looking through the ROBA's archive and finding these forgotten, a lot of them now demolished brutalist play spaces and recreating them at one-to-one -one in the gallery environment, celebrating their surreal nature. These things are great and shouldn't be forgotten. So I think um, <clears throat> one of the reasons this kind of brutalist 
theme is coming out in, in, in interior zone and um, sort of design generally at the moment is that there's an awareness that materials like concrete actually do have a lifespan. So when these things were built, they were meant to last forever. But as architects will tell you, concrete only lasts a set number of sort of decades before it needs to get replaced, before it needs to get sort of rebuilt and patched up and sort of attended to. And a lot of these massive brutalist landmarks in the UK particularly are reaching that stage in their lifespan where they need to be sort of reconsidered. Do we sort of renew these things for another generation? Or do we sort of demolish them and start again? So it's an interesting dialogue that's happening in international design at the moment, um, which is why you get really great uh, Instagram accounts like This Brutal Life, which is um, a guy in the UK who goes around photographing these brutalist buildings and showing that they are sort of lovable at the same time. They're not just hard, cold, functional spaces. He sort of shows them for the kind of architectural beauties that they can be. Um, and then, as I said, concrete homewares are just a really interesting thing at the moment. So this is 28, which is a South African studio who make all kinds of lighting and bowls and homeware out of concrete. So just using this material in unexpected places as well. Um, and again, in kind of your wall treatments as well, these are concrete panels. So you can kind of clad walls with concrete retrospectively as well. Trend number five is what we call strange geometry. And what we see here um, is that basic, almost pure geometric shapes are being used by a lot of designers as their kind of key design motif. So this chapel in Japan, for example, is just made up purely of triangles, sort of showing the purity of that form. This was a, a gate in Canada, also made up of these kind of geometric cutouts. Um, and because of this kind of almost childlike reverence for geometric shapes, we're seeing things like origami becoming an interesting design treatment at the moment. So. These are blinds that are not kind of folded or Roman. They, well, they are folded, but they're, they're folded like, um, like paper and not like fabric. So we're speaking with kind of a different design language when you look at something like that. And we're seeing this almost very fractal design being used in products as well. So sort of creating shapes within shapes within shapes, but again, always coming back to this purity of form and showing the underlying structure behind everything. And a lot of the time, this is very mutable and very kind of user use a customizable at the same time. So this sofa by grid, for example, is made up of these very pure shapes, but you can uh, mix and match these however you want in order to create your own sort of geometric form. And brands like, um, this is Firm Living, have been doing this for a while, so kind of playing with this geometry. And it's an interesting step on from the um, facet trend that we've been seeing for so long, these kind of almost um, gem-like facets and everything. What we're seeing now is the facets are being flattened out and we're playing with perspective. So if you look at some of the treatments in the Plascon color forecast, for example, they're about taking this kind of what looks like it should be a 3D shape and then flattening it down and using color and perspective to make it look quite interesting. Sorry, I keep catching myself there and freaking myself out. Um, and then again, we're just seeing this is another firm living example of the kind of the using these kind of circles and squares and pure forms again as well. Trend number six is elegant distress. And what we're seeing, and this is something we've seen for a while and is just becoming increasingly important this year, is this use of patina and oxidization and wear in products to kind of create modern heirlooms. So the psyche behind this is quite interesting because we're living in a very disposable culture. So with your kind of H&M homes or any number of high street home retailers, you don't really buy stuff in your home to last. You buy it for a season and then you sort of intentionally want to be throwing it away. So what designers are doing because of this, um, what we're seeing is that people don't get heirlooms anymore. You're not going to pass a kind of IKEA bed down to your grandchildren because it's not going to last that long. So designers are playing with things like patina and wear to sort of create modern heirlooms and simulate this in products. So this is a really great, again, a lot of this starts with fashion. So this was a great Adidas um, sort of collaboration, creating these Statue of Liberty inspired sneakers. But Tom Dixon was doing it as well with his massive metal chair. This is from last year's Plascon forecast, but you can see how this distress was being used in paint treatments as well, sort of creating this lived in look as well in spaces. Um, and in textiles, we're seeing this increasingly. So this is from ABC Carpet and Home in New York, and it's made from salvaged, really quite beaten up rugs. Um, and again, CC2P, the French, I think, uh, carpet brand is doing a very similar thing with their rugs. And again, it's about really sort of oxidizing and putting objects through their paces so that by the time they come to the user, become, they come to the owner, they're kind of pre-loved, they're kind of pre-owned in a way so that you feel like you've got a sense of permanence and history built into them. Um, and what we saw even in something like Maison et Objet, 
the, the trade show in Paris, we saw um, wooden objects being boiled in oil and sort of blown with blow torches and really sort of wrecked in a way to try and give them this built, uh, built in heritage. Trend number seven is noir. And what we're seeing here is the last gasp of black in design. So in fashion, we're seeing this massive resurgence in black. And a moment, in a, sort of I'll have a postscript on black and fashion as well. But black on black on black being quite important in fashion. Charcoal and burnt wood being quite an important design motif. So we saw this in food a while ago, actually, a couple of seasons ago, with um, people like the Brazilian chef Alex Atala sort of using burnt and smoky and charred flavors in his food because we'd kind of used all of the other flavors, including the kind of savory umami. So the only flavor he could find that was new was this burnt flavor, like by physically destroying the food that people were going to eat. So because of this, um, we're seeing this, this kind of burnt blackness being used in design. So former Phantasma creating a water filter out of this charcoal. Um, it's an interesting trend in, in wooden finishes as well. We're seeing wooden flooring and wooden tables and other objects that, like I'd said, look like they've been burnt and battered and really kind of sort of scorched. Um, these are the, the boards from Maison et Objet that were actually boiled in oil and then blowtorched to really give them this kind of blackness. And it's the reason we're seeing is sort of at the same time a lot of this sort of uh, matte chalkboard finish as well. So it's this, this sort of, it feels burnt and it feels tactile, even if it's not actually burnt. And black kitchens as well were an interesting blip on the trend curve, which is quite kind of counterintuitive, but it's all linked to this real fascination with black at the moment. But, and this is a big but, because if you believe the, the Dutch trend forecaster Lee Idelkut, it's the end of black in fashion. So she believes in the next couple of seasons we'll stop seeing black as a key color. It'll all move towards brown. And then when that happens, it'll happen in homeware as well. So if you're really into black, like me, you might want to start reconsidering what you're going to look like wearing mid-toned browns, because that's apparently what's coming. I try not to believe it. Um, trend number eight is bedrooms. And we're seeing, increasingly, people trying to make every room or every part of their home like their bed. So we're seeing... Um, sort of your furniture look like it's sort of quilted and duveted and your f it sort of looks like you could just rip, th rip that off. And I actually think you can pull that off and use it as a duvet and a quilt. Um, we saw this great ostrich pillow, which allows you to sort of take a nap anywhere you like um, just by sort of sticking your head and your hands into it. I do want to get one of those for my office. Um, and things like this, uh, this couch, for example, as well, that allows you to sort of play with the bedding however you want and create the look that's right for you. So it's about this um, comfort in design as well. Um, and again, it's this kind of this sheeting edging that we're seeing on, on couches. These kind of couches come day beds that are being used a lot more now than they were before. And I think what a lot of it is, is it's about this, um, the changing way that people are living in spaces. So especially if you're living in a smaller space or a more open plan space, as we're seeing as the massive trend to doing, you kind of want your whole house to be an extension of the most comfortable room of your house. And it's the, the kind of millennial reaction to how stuffy their parents' suburban houses were. So you always try and react against the generation that came before you. So we're seeing this kind of reaction against your perfect suburban sort of formal lounge, bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, and kind of creating something that blurs more rather than is sort of too cleanly defined. And of course, someone like the Borelek brothers were doing this, I think this is even five or six or seven years ago, they created this kind of fort for adults that you could put in your lounge. So we've seen this happening in design for a long time. It's just filtering now through into the mainstream. Trend number nine is Afrofutures. And this is a particularly interesting one, and it draws from, um, we, as well as this, do a, what we call an ITI macro trend review, which is a sort of about an hour to an hour and a half long presentation on big picture social and lifestyle trends from a kind of branding perspective. And one of the trends we identified there was Afrofuturism, which is this use of um, a, a new kind of African creativity, a new kind of African spirit that's not premised on either a stereotypical look at Africa or trying to make Africa look like Scandinavia, Europe, uh, the US, or whatever you want. So it's this kind of uniquely African, almost sci-fi creativity. I actually think the latest El Deco um, issue is Afrofuturism as well, so it's worth checking that out. 
But um, we're seeing things like African textiles, textiles and prints, for example, being used a lot. Really interesting art projects like um, Afronauts over there, which imagined what if the world's first space project came out of Africa, not out of the US? What would this have looked like? What would our Afronauts have looked like? It's a really fascinating photo, uh, photo essay. Um, brands like Dr. and Mrs. making these amazing cabinets sort of inspired by African headrests and African totems. Rene Rousseau, who's actually showing here as well with her distale um, chairs, you can see this is an older iteration of the design, but this kind of taking African-inspired patterns, but not making them look purely indebele or purely like Zulu love letters, but sort of reinterpreting them and making them look new and fresh. And this was a reference for another audience, but you've got to go downstairs and check out 100% Designs Textile Africa exhibition, because this, this comes from that. And it just shows this exact same kind of very futuristic, very fresh take on African creativity, rather than just trying to always make stuff look expected and curio. And egg designs, this is a classic egg design feature, but you can ex ex sort of see again this um, very futuristic African take. And then trend number 10 which is hard candy. And what we're seeing here is this um, reappropriation of pastels again by sort of everyone else for a change. Because for a long time in color trends, pastels were the kind of and finally trend. So if you didn't like a neutral and you didn't like a bright trend, kind of the ladies got the pastel trend. But what we're seeing now is it's becoming quite gender neutral and becoming quite fresh and almost hard edged again. That's why I called it hard candy because at the more directional edge of this, you're seeing this very punk appropriation of pastel. So taking pastel and making it look quite edgy. So this is a, um, it's a store in Japan, opening ceremony, I think. Um, brands like Lucky Boy Sunday, taking pastel colors and really using them for designs that are quite fresh and quite edgy. I mean, you've got to have your pastel skull as well, obviously. Um, Muto, the, the Scandinavian design coming out with their pastel light bulbs. So what we're seeing is this is very influenced by the Nordic design and the kind of global north, and a lot of it depends on the use of neutrals and naturals as well, so it, it doesn't look too sweet and too sugary. It's about making sure that it's either quite sophisticated or quite hard-edged. And then I actually lied, because I have two more trends. Um, so there's 11, which is impermeable, and this is more of an architectural trend. Um, and what we're seeing here is that homes and spaces are really playing with this distinction between inside and outside. So. For a long time, or for the kind of last couple of years, uh, creating spaces or homes has been very much about defining you are outside and now I am inside and kind of creating space to seal yourself off for the world. But now we're seeing this understanding that you need to be connected to the world in some level. So what we're seeing is homes um, expressing this by having this level of permeability and this level of dialogue with the outside. And it's quite an interesting trend to think of in terms of South African reality where we don't have a really great relationship with public space and we don't have a really great relationship with our neighbors. So it's interesting to see how we're gonna negotiate this. So this is a Japanese designer called Su Fujimoto. And this house is created of three per uh, perforated boxes stacked one on top of each other. So depending on where you are in the house, you get a different view. So your first box is your garden, your sec second box is your slightly private rooms, and your third box is your most private rooms. So as you move inside, you get more and more privacy, but still connected to the outside world. This is another Sufa Jamoja piece. He calls it the most beautiful public toilet in the world. So it's a toilet in a glass box surrounded by its own private garden. So it's completely private because you lock the little fence when you go in. Um, but it's completely, perme it's completely permeable and completely public at the same time. So you can see this tension and this playing between it. I'm desperate to go here, purely just to say I've been. Um, but we're seeing a similar thing in a very African context as well. So this is Christian Benema, a Rwandan architect who does this thing a lot in public health spaces. So this is his cholera treatment center um, in Haiti, I think. Um, and it's surrounded by these really great uh, perforated screens. So what he wanted to do was not um, hide sick people away, not hide them sort of, uh, sort of in a corner and in the dark, but rather allow them to be in the space where there is air and there is light and there is connection to other people. So a lot of his buildings use these kind of perforated screens. And you'll remember I said back to this, uh, I think the first trend, about the Brie Soleil and the sunscreen being quite important now as well as architectural references. I mean, uh, Skinny Lemix, the Cape Town-based designer, one of her latest uh, textile ranges is inspired by these classic uh, sunscreens that you see around Cape Town. So we're seeing people looking at these again rather than just air conditioning the hell out of their homes. Um, this is an interesting home in India. It's called the Zombie Proof Home. Um, so it plays with this, uh, these marble panels that can open and close. So again, you see this permeability versus impermeability being played with as well at an architectural level. 
and this is another Christian Benamo building, um, with, again, with your, your kind of perforated screens. And then at a very macro artistic scale, what we're seeing with this is something like the Serpentine Pavilion in London. So every year, a new designer gets given the space in the Serpentine Pavilion, or in the Serpentine, and is asked to build a pavilion that's kind of a, a statement of design or artistic intent. And Bjarke Ingels um, did the most recent one, and he created a pavilion that looked like a wall was unzipping. So when you stand in it, you can be very public if you're looking one way and very private if you're looking the other way. So again, it's about d sort of blurring the boundaries between inside and outside permeability and impermeability. And I'm not going to show the video because it's long. Um, and then the last one is friendly design. And what we're seeing here is we're surrounding ourselves increasingly with uh, homeware and objects that are becoming our friends. They're becoming sort of little uh, sort of creatures in our home. So whether it's things like this count, this chair by the designer Jaime Hayon, and it's called the catch chair because it looks like it's holding its hands out to catch you, or these little Norman lamps that are meant to look like little people looking at you. We're seeing, and it, it sort of speaks back to this tactile design thing, this is why I ended with this, that our world is becoming quite bland and quite sterile. So we're seeking to surround ourselves with things that look like they might just be a little bit alive. They might just be a little bit friendly, like this Jocha uh, bench by Frank Baum that's meant to look like a Shangololo. Um, and Haldine Martin has a similar one. So you're seeing this kind of giving our objects just a little bit of life. Um, some brands, for example, like uh, Coziol and Alessi have built their whole uh, sort of pitch around this. And it, it gets quite kitsch at this level or quite um, themey. So this is meant to look like an aria singer and obviously a little hedgehog. Um, but what it speaks to at a sort of more social level is what this designer um, was trying to get to. And this is a, a concept called Be My Mother, which is about three appliances that aren't just things you own. They're actually sort of pets in your home. So the rubbish bin, for example, when it gets too full, it's, it's motorized. So it tries to run away from you. It plays hide and seek with you so that you can't put more stuff in it. Uh, the toaster sneezes when it needs to have its dust tray emptied. Um, and this is a little vacuum cleaner that when it fills up its little ball of, of um, dust, it kind of poops it out and makes a little noise and then sort of runs away from you. And what this designer was trying to speak to, which is quite interesting, is this idea of emotional durability. So again, so much of the things that we own or so many of the things that we own are, um, are disposable and they're not meant to last. Well, what she said is that if you have an emotional connection with something, you're less likely to throw it away. You're less likely to get rid of it because it's sort of part of your family. It's something that you own. So again, this is why we're seeing these kind of cute designs coming out more and more. So that was a real kind of whistle-stop tour, and that was exactly 30 minutes, I'm quite proud of myself, of um, sort of the top 10 plus two design trends for 2016. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.